Good morning to the honorable members of this house and to all who are able to see and hear our proceedings. Our scripture lesson this morning comes from Luke chapter 3, verses 2 to 6. At that time, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the desert. So John went throughout the whole territory of the Jordan River preaching. Turn away from your sins and be baptized and God will forgive your sins. As it is written in the book of the prophet Isaiah, someone is shouting in the desert, get the road ready for the Lord, make a straight path for him to travel. The word of the Lord came to John at that time. The word of God comes to us today. This Advent season, or the four weeks before Christmas, is a time to think about our sins and shortcomings, our failures and mistakes, with a view to doing better from now on. Turn away and be forgiven. In what direction is our personal and spiritual life headed? What are our private indulgences? What are our national actions and attitudes that need to stop right now? To so, owe oh God an indescribable debt of gratitude, sending a savior to rescue us. Time in the next few weeks to listen for a word from the Lord. Let us hear and obey. Second thoughts. In the desert. For many people, these are desert times. It is not a time of great prosperity for most people. It is not a time of great productivity for a good number of our people. We are facing a future that seems bleak with rising costs and static salaries. We need a savior to give us hope. We need a savior to give us joy need a savior to give us peace. Mr. Prime Minister, ministers of government, members of opposition, others present, you may feel as if you are in a desert of high expectations and you are not able to deliver all that you would wish. Be encouraged that we are to make a straight path for the one who has all the answers. Turn to the Lord in prayer. Read the word of God for a word from God. Nothing we face is harder than that which others have faced before at different times in world history. Let us lift our eyes to heaven. Let us lift our feet with renewed energy. Let us walk the straight and narrow so that our children will learn that this is how you overcome adversity. The Lord is coming and we need to be ready. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hello. Peter Turnquist, Brent Simonet, Desmond Bannister, Brenwood Bell, Jeffrey Lloyd, Dr. Dwayne Sands, Marvin Zane, Frankie Campbell, Dionisio Diagular, Michael Pintard, Darren Penfield, Jamal Ferreira, Lanisha Roll, Brentel Roll, Eldridge Johnson, Philip Davis, Vaughn Miller, Patricia Edgecombe, Iram Lewis, Carlton Boleg, James Albury, Travis Robinson, Adrian Gibson, Donald Sanders, Frederick McElhain, Hank Johnson, Mark Hume, Michael Falk, Miriam Emanuel, Reese Chipman, Ruben Rami, Brittany Mackey, Shannon Jen Cartwright, Chanel Ferguson, Glennis Hannah Martin, High Snow Four, Chester Cooper. <laughs> Good morning, honorable members. Honorable members, we have a, a special group with us this morning. We have a group from 
the Ministry of Tourism and Aviation joining us this morning. It's the Air Accident Investigating Authority. Can you please stand for us, please? Thank you so much. The chair now recognizes the honorable member for Freetown, who will bring brief greetings. Oh, oh, okay. Thank you very much. Which is, which is even more pleasant that they are going to be with us for a period today, or perhaps throughout the day, as we debate the subject that is most relevant and important to the Accident and Investigating Authority. Introduction and swearing in of new members. Laying of documents by ministers. The chair recognizes the honorable member for East Grand Bahama. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The table the house, the Disaster Reconstruction Authority Special Economic Zone Recover Relief Order 2019. Order that the document be brought up. Order that the document to lie on the table. Further laying of documents by ministers. I you. recognize the honorable member for East Grand Bahama. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I beg leave to lay on the table of the House the Anti Terrorism Amendment Regulation 2019. Order that the document be brought up. Order that the document do lie on the table. Further laying of documents by ministers. Chair recognizes the honorable member for East Grand Bahama. Sorry, sorry. Uh, one second, sir. I beg please to lay on the table of the House the Disaster Re Reconstruction Authority Designation of Special Economic Recovery Zone Order 2019. Thank you, Honorable Member. Order that the document be brought up. that the document do lie on the table. Further laying of documents by ministers. <laughs> Honorable members in the interim, um, I, I wish to uh, recognize uh, another group that is in the gallery this morning with us. Of course, yesterday was the International Day for Disaster or Disability or Persons with, with, with Disability. Let me correct that Freudian slip. Uh, we now recognize you. Can you please stand? Thank you so much. Uh, at this moment, we would recognize the honorable member for Sudden Shores with responsibility.
The chair now, the chair now recognizes the honorable member for Southern Shores. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Yesterday, we celebrated with the rest of the world um, an International Day of Persons with Disabilities. We started off with the church service on Sunday. And Mr. Speaker, as the person with responsibility for that community, I've always said how they inspire me. I watch them, Mr. Speaker, those that are visually impaired, those that are hard of hearing and deaf, those who have mobility impediments, face those challenges every day. They get up and they focus on the things that they are able to do, and they focus on ways that they can find their independence. Mr. Speaker, in 2014, we passed the Persons with Disabilities Act. The Parliamentary Secretary in our ministry is working on the regulations that are needed to complete that, Mr. Speaker. And he has confirmed that he will update the management team on the 12th of this month. But, Mr. Speaker, the reality is we all, we all have some disability or the other. And if that were our focus, we probably wouldn't be here. And so I continue to admire the community of persons with disabilities for focusing on their abilities. Last night we had a concert, dancing, singing, poetry, reading. It was inspiring, it was uplifting. I spent most of the time on my feet. I did some dancing and had to search for some Bengay. <laughs> But that is the kind of fun that we that is the kind of fun that we we had, and that is the kind of spirit that is dominant in our community of persons with disabilities. We have a responsibility, particularly those here in the parliament, to ensure that there is inclusion, to ensure that there is accessibility. I had to confess to Ms. Jasmine last night that there is no likelihood that this house, this building, will be wheelchair accessible. But I took the liberty, Mr. Speaker, on your behalf to say that when you get this new House of Assembly that you are lobbying for, that there will be adequate access for all persons. I invite the entire Bahamas to exercise some patience with those who may move a little slower, to exercise some patience with those who may speak a little slower, but to be mindful, to be mindful that there are many members of the community of persons with disabilities, one in particular, Ms. Iris Adley, who is a consultant in our office, who was a beauty queen, who was an employee of the Ministry of Tourism working abroad when she was involved in a traffic accident that rendered her in a position that she probably never thought she would have been in. And so likewise, if God blesses us with enough good mornings, arthritis is going to kick in. We too will have some mobility impediments. Our, our bad eating habits, etc., will cause us to have visual and hearing uh, impediments. And so, Mr. Speaker, what we are able to do here as legislators might actually be preparing accessibility for us in years to come. So I implore everyone who has an opportunity to do something to do it. And I invite us all to exercise the necessary prudence that we can prevent those things that are preventable. And I want to say before I take my seat, Mr. Speaker, the new legislation that is being discussed will ensure that the parking spaces for persons with disabilities are not only available, but those persons that are not eligible to park in them will find themselves there will pay the cost of I congratulate the community for working hard to ensure that there is this awareness. Um, there is one amongst them, Mr. Speaker, who is president of the blind and visually impaired, Henry Roll. Mr. Roll is a, is a big prankster. 
And um, I asked next year to be the MC of the concert so I could get him back. <laughs> I congratulate them, and I wish that we would all act accordingly. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much, Honorable Member. Did, did you recognize this Honorable Member for Anderson? Thank you, Speaker. Thank you for the opportunity, and I also just want to join uh, on behalf of the official opposition in congratulating the commission and the work that they do. And just to highlight for a moment the le groundbreaking legislation, Persons with Disabilities Equal Opportunities Act, and the sort of things, Mr. Speaker, that, is, that are protected by law and um, the rights, the rights of those with disabilities. And they include, like, rights of persons with disabilities, the, that not being denied employment, the right to access vocational training skills, development and training programs, the right not to be discriminated by employers, it's prohibited by law, that the right to health care services, right to housing, sorry, the right to ac uh, have accessibility and mobility, the right to access public buildings and to have parking, and this is a serious one, public transportation, Mr. Speaker. This is one that has not really been fully addressed and is really overdue now, but that's something that's protected in the legislation and we have to buffer it now. Um, the right to have service animals, and the right to access auxiliary social services and to, um, to have the right to have access to sports and recreation and the right to, um, to vote to, under the Parliamentary Elections Act. So the, the, the basic fundamental tenets of human existence are protected in this legislation. And so um, I, I, I again want to congratulate the work of the commission and to, I want to just highlight Erin Brown. I believe she was at the United Nations. And for a moment there, Mr. Speaker, I didn't, I forgot Erin Brown is a person with disabilities because she is such an amazing woman. She's an athlete, she's an activist. She is, she is prominent, she is, she's traveling. And it, it threw me off a little because I, I, I forgot. Um, and she, and that, this is a, that's a case of what you spoke of, someone who really rose above her, her disabilities, and um, I think that it, it's something that we need to champion for all persons with disabilities. There are people in my constituency, they're DTVI, they're doing well, they're thriving, they're pushing, and so, um, and there's some in, in housing that's being fitted by the Ministry of Housing, especially. So, um, the, you know, the, the underlying principle is that there's, we all have a spectrum of abilities, and that the, the purpose of governance is to and show access to all persons. For example, in children, it says every child has the right to learn. And so, uh, again, I, I congratulate the, the work of this body and, um, and urge us to continue to support all aspects of human development of persons with disabilities. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Honorable Member. Honorable Members, as we move on, we still are delaying of documents by Minister, the Chair recognizes the Honorable Member for East Grand Bahama. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I beg leave to lay on the table of the House the Disaster Reconstruction Authority Act 2019, appointed day notice 2019. Order that the document be brought up. Order that the document do lie on the table. Further laying of documents by ministers. Statements and communications by ministers. The chair recognizes the honorable member for Bamboo Town. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, over the past week, I've had the distinct pleasure of participating in the 31st International Maritime Assembly in London, England. Thank you from the 23rd to the 30th of November, 2019. So I stand to inform the House that the Bahamas was successfully re-elected to the IMO Council for the 2020-2021 biannuum on Friday, the 29th of November, 2019. Mr. Speaker, <clears throat> Mr. 
What is of particular note is the fact that we secured, Mr. Speaker, for the first time in history, the sixth highest number of votes cast of the 20 member states elected to category C, which was a total of 137 nations voting for the Bahamas to represent them. Mr. Speaker, at the outset, I wish to unreservedly recognize and commend the yeoman contributions, collaborative efforts, and tremendous work of the Ministry of Transport and Local Government, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Attorney General's Office, the Bahamas Maritime Authority, the Port Department, and all other government agencies that have contributed to the fulfillment of the Bahamas' international maritime commitment and obligations as a result of this achievement. I wish to especially recognize the following diligent professionals of whom we can all be proud. Our High Commissioner Green Slade in London, Ambassador Lewis Johnson, the BMA Board Deputy Chair, Mr. Galandres, the BMA Managing Director and CEO, Captain Hutchison, the BMA Head of Maritime Affairs, Ms. Marie Callery, and the Bahamas' High Commission, Third Secretary, Vice Consul, Mr. Marche Mackey. The Bahamas Maritime Attaché, Mr. Bernice Pinder, and other staff from the BMA's London office. Mr. Speaker, at this juncture, I would truly be remiss if I did not provide a little background on this specialized agency and the election process. The IMO is the United Nations specialized agency with the mission of establishing global standards for the safety, security, and environmental performance of international shipping. The IMO's consul, which comprises of 40 member states, is the executive organ of the IMO and is responsible for supervising the work of the IMO between the sessions of the IMO assembly. The pursuit of membership on this council, Mr. Speaker, is customarily highly competitive. And this year was no exception, with 26 countries vying for 20 seats. Additionally, the session boasted some 1,700 delegates from 170 countries in attendance, the most ever represented at an IMO assembly. Mr. Speaker, the Bahamas and Jamaica, which were CARICOM and DOS, were the only two Caribbean countries seeking membership in category C of the Consul, and both achieved mm. such. Mr. Speaker, in my opening address to the Consul, I embrace the opportunity to share and highlight the cutting edge contributions made by the Bahamas Registry, which has the sterling reputation in the industry as being well regulated and disciplined. Similarly, in my closing address, I underscored the fact that as a respected member of the Consul, the Bahamas brings reasoned, practical, and balanced perspectives to the table. Indeed, we have demonstrated that we not only support the reforms being advocated for the maritime industry, particularly from a regulatory perspective, but we support the advancement of women in the industry and are also proponents for improved and enhanced operational efficiencies in the sector. In closing, Mr. Speaker, I wish to further underscore the importance of this election and how coveted the operations and the decisions of the IMO Group C Board is or are. Mr. Speaker, less than 24 hours after these elections, just to show you how important being a part of this board is, less than 24 hours after the election, member states have already earnestly and aggressively begun preparations for the election by booking the IMO venue site to hold their country's reception in 2021. Mr. Speaker, our election to the IMO Consul is indeed noteworthy, is indeed a noteworthy achievement. And I am indeed proud to have participated in this process. Mr. Speaker, I thank you. Thank, thank you, Honorable Member. Honorable Member, are you, are you tabling? Order that the document be brought up.
all of that, the communication, no lie on the table. Further, statements and communication by ministers. The chair recognizes the honorable member for East Grand Bahama. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, just to make a brief uh, communication on the Bahamas being listed by the French government uh, on its list of non-cooperative states for tax purposes. Mr. Speaker, I wish to inform this House that this morning I met with the French ambassador and was presented a letter from the French Minister of Public Action and Accounts informing me that the French government has included the Bahamas on the French list of non-cooperative states and, tax and territories in tax matters. This blacklisting relates to our tax information exchange agreement with France and the perception by the French authorities that the Bahamas has not been responding to requests for information in a manner that is satisfactory to them. The cases at question concern sensitive matters involving French nationals. While the Ministry has responded to these matters on, at, pursuant to our agreement, French authorities are of the view that our responses were not sufficient. It is disappointing and regrettable that France did not engage the dispute resolution mechanisms provided in the Multilateral Convention on Mutual Assistance in Tax Matters, which we signed in December of 2017, to facilitate the exchange of information for tax purposes. This demonstrates a complete disregard for the damaging repercussions and significant long-term impact that these unilateral punitive measures have on allied countries like the Bahamas that are fully engaged at the highest level of international cooperation. The Bahamas is a member of the Global Forum for Tax Transparency, as is France. I was personally in France just last week at the Global Forum plenary, and at no time was it indicated that France was considering this action. <clears throat> I advise the ambassador that such a surreptitious posture, knowing that they intended to blacklist us, is an affront to an amicable relationship that we have fostered with France and the European Union. Amicable, yeah. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, that's my formal statement, but I would say that I also expressed to the ambassador this morning our total disappointment, disgust, <laughs> and one might even say anger at the method in which they have gone about this whole process of listing. As I indicated, Mr. Speaker, we are all members of the Global Forum. The Bahamas is an inaugural member, having been involved in the ad hoc group that led to the formation of the Global Forum on Tax Transparency Matters. And as I indicated in the statement, there is a dispute mechanism that countries can avail themselves of if they feel that a country is not being cooperative. The Bahamas has gone through significant pains to pass a suite of legislation, much to the disdain of the industry, that has made us uncompetitive in some regards. And yet, rather than our partners having the diplomacy, the respect, to at least engage with the state at the highest level, that is with the competent authority, the Minister of Finance, or if that is insufficient with the Prime Minister of the country, they proceed in a less than transparent manner to damage the reputation of the Bahamas by placing it on a list. Mr. Speaker, it is not within the operation of the United Nations and the way that relationships between countries is expected to take place. I have expressed to the, the French ambassador, as I said, our disappointment, our total disgust with the way that this has been done, the disrespectful manner in which the Bahamas has been treated in this particular regard, and we intend to communicate that to the Global Forum, 
to the OECD and to the EU, as there is no point, Mr. Speaker, with us engaging in these multilateral organizations if individual members are going to take unilateral action, particularly without dialogue at the highest level. They expect commitment from us at the highest political levels. And you remember that the OECD blacklisted us about a year ago because they claimed that we did not engage with them at the highest political level. Well, the same is true here. They have not engaged with us on a manner at the highest political level, or indeed at any level. And so we will communicate our feelings in this regard formally, because again, Mr. Speaker, the Bahamas is a committed partner to tax, to tax transparency and cooperation and the fulfillment of our obligations with our international partners. So again, Mr. Speaker, I, I put that on the record. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much, Honorable Member. Um, honorable member for East Grand Bahama, just before we proceed. Um, uh, the, the communication? I, I do beg your indulgence. Uh, because it, the matter is so fresh, uh, and maybe even the way I speak, you can determine it's fresh. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> I will, I will table the document uh, as soon as I can print it, Mr. Speaker, if that's okay. I don't want to give you my, my iPad. Honorable Member for Cat Island, Ron Pinson, Salvador, you wish to? Uh, the Chair recognizes the Honorable Member for Cat Island, Ron Pinson, Salvador. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Just let me indicate that we in the opposition join the minister, the member for, no, member for East Grand Bahama in the expressions of outrage in the manner in which this matter has come to us. Um, the speaker, well, from about 2000, the country has been under assault uh, in respect to one of its contributing arm to our gross domestic product, what? Gross domestic product, and that is in the, in the financial services um, industry. And despite all efforts, there always appears to be the moving of the gold coast um, by the international community. We do not point fingers in this regard, but I only caution that we try to understand why is it that before being too bullish in our response, why is it? Because it starts off, as I understand, that the reasons undergirding this blacklisting is our failure to properly respond to requests. One of our challenges have been over the many years, not just with France, but many of our partners um, around the world, is as our ability to respond to requests as an exhibition, uh, multilateral, multi uh, exchange of information, and it is because, and we have, during the course of the suite of, of passing the field of legislation, which is not only, as you pointed out, uh, to the chagrin of the industry, but also to, to, to the chagrin of the Treasury, because it's impacted, in many ways, our revenue source. Uh, so, so we need to be in, the, in those debates. We always try to remind ourselves that we can pass these laws 
but enforcement is also key element. Enforcement requires proper resourcing and setting up of the various um, structures to be able to respond. And the Attorney General's office is our is the pivotal or the competent authority in most instances to which these requests have been made. And we have been lamenting for quite a while. We've been lamenting for quite a while. Not just now. Our showing up and ensuring that they are as responsible as the office. That we have sufficiently competent individuals in the department here to deal with these matters. And so it is disappointing that that they would claim that we have not sufficiently uh, responded to their request. So I say before we be too bullet, try to understand, I think, um, why would they act in such a draconian, unilateral, and almost what I call arbitrary manner? Before, because you may find that you may be responding bullish, and they may be able to point out to you why they were, why they acted in that way. Don't forget now, the ambassador is only a messenger, and so in Canada, so <coughs> perhaps. Um, you may want to, to speak, like we say, we hear the frustration, but it is very important that we have and speak to some action plan on this matter, and perhaps also on the FATF uh, monitoring list and see where, what is happening there as well. Because we have continued to be proactive in these matters. And as I said, <coughs> see, when we when we discuss, uh, when we are discussing the issues of the CRS common reporting standards and, and whether we call multilateral or, or bilateral in these matters, these are all the things that that inform the way the way forward. And sometimes we have to sit down and talk. See, we did everything they said, but yet still, we find ourselves in a similar position that we thought we were part And so it is important to identify an action plan. Identify why did they act in such a draconian, arbitrary, <coughs> and disrespectful manner, which I accept. Because there may be something else underlying this action. I invite you to pause, inquire, and being delivered in your Thank you. Mr. recognizes the Honorable Member for East Grand Bahama. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I recognize that this is not a debate, uh, but I do want to just uh, assure the member <clears throat> that uh, on the on the rumored um, listing that the Ministry of Finance, which is the competent authority with respect to tax matters, polled each and every regulator that comes within the ambit, that we polled every ministry that would have any connection to the exchange of any kind of tax matter or MLAT matter, to determine whether they were aware of, had received any request outstand, that's outstanding, whether they had received any follow-up to any request that had been responded to. The fact of the matter is, Mr. Speaker, that we have none. We have none, as far as we were aware. And that is on the record. So the, 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 the points made by the leader of the opposition are well taken. He's correct. We need to make sure that we understand what is the genesis of this. The French ambassadors communicated a list of uh, requests that are at question for them. And we are in the process, right now as we speak, in, the deter in determining what could possibly be the issue with respect to those, because we do not have them as outstanding. And as far as we are concerned, the requests have been responded to. And so we have no request outstanding. None. Absolutely none, according to our record. And again, 
uh, as I as I indicated, if the authority, if the French authorities had bothered to send us back a note to say that we received your request or, or your information or response, but we do not perceive it to be adequate, then we would have had a basis. But we will look into it to see what is their concern, and we will respond to it and be guided by it in respect to future requests that may come along. So, so I'll leave that there, Mr. Speaker. <coughs> Thank you, Honorable Member. Point noted. Who you talking about? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Further statements and communication by ministers? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Honorable Member. Recognize. Uh, oh. Recognize? Yes. Uh, the chair recognizes the Honorable Member for East Grand Bahama. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, Earlier, I had the honor to table the Disaster Reconstruction Authority Special Economic Recovery Zone Relief Order 2019, which outlines new tax relief provisions that are now available to residents and businesses in Grand Bahama, Abaco, and the surrounding Keys impacted by Hurricane Dorian. It has been about two months since Dorian wrecked havoc on the Northern Bahamas, leaving residents displaced from their homes and their jobs, and moving commerce to a virtual standstill. In the immediate aftermath of the storm, we made a commitment to help the people of Abaco and Grand Bahama and the surrounding Keys to rebound from devastating impacts of Hurricane Dorian with the firm support of their government. We declared the impacted islands to be special economic recovery zones, or SEERS as we call it for short, and moved swiftly and decisively to implement various exigency orders to provide immediate tax relief. These provisions facilitated a successful humanitarian relief effort that was mobilized by local and international stakeholders in government, civil society, and the private sector. They helped to ensure the rapid flow of humanitarian aid into the islands and into the hands of people who most needed it. Today, we are here to strengthen and expand these efforts, recognizing that the early phases of relief and recovery are behind us and the medium to long-term recovery and reconstruction is yet ahead of us. Unlike the previous tax relief measures, the Sears Order 2019 delivers a more comprehensive package of tax breaks on the import and purchase of goods, and, it, and, it's extended, and it extends the timeline for people to benefit from the tax breaks to the end of the fiscal year ending June 30th, 2020, at which time the renewal of those incentives will be reassessed. It expands the list of items that are approved for tax waivers, and it adds new benefits, including a provision for the value-added tax-free purchase of all goods at the cash register within the Sears zone. Indeed, the package of tax breaks will allow individuals to rebuild their homes and their lives more affordably and with greater speed. Mr. Speaker, the package of tax breaks includes the following provisions. One, when you shop locally with businesses in Grand Bahama, Abaco, or anywhere inside the recovery zone, you will pay no, no VAT and no duty on all approved goods. Two, when you import cargo directly into the recovery zone, you will pay zero taxes. Again, for residents and businesses inside the zone, cargo imported directly is tax-free. Three, although pre-approval is required for all of the import provisions, individuals who shop abroad and import their goods with accompanied or unaccompanied baggage also have the benefit of tax-free import on approved items. This means at the seaport where the ferry docks, when the ferry docks in Grand Bahama, as a Bellaria or, or celebration, and at the airports where direct flights land in Marsh Harbor Treasury or at Freeport, they these items will be imported tax free. Four. Mr. Speaker, the Sears Order 2019 also allows for tax relief from all business license fees, tax relief on real property tax for improved properties, and tax relief on the sale of realty. 
Five. If you buy a piece of property inside the recovery zone, that on the sale of that property will be discounted up to 50%, depending on the property value. It is a sliding scale. Six, additionally, we've included provisions that allow pre-approved individuals and businesses from the affected islands to purchase goods with the tax breaks from Nassau suppliers or other vendors outside of the economic zone. That means that the wholesalers in New Providence or from other areas, hardware stores, whatever, they're able to sell to uh, residents in the affected area on the same basis as you would uh, the, the imp import from, from a foreign source. So that gives the, our domestic um, suppliers the same competitive advantage as we give the foreign uh, uh, um, suppliers. We level the playing field in that regard. Mr. Speaker, make no mistake. Despite the tremendous work that has been done so far to recover from Dorian, there are still many people suffering in the Northern Bahamas. Let us remember the housing sector was most severely affected by Hurricane Dorian, with damages estimated at $1.48 billion. Approximately 9,000 homes and over 11 million square feet of structures sustained damages on Abaco and Grand Bahama with approximately 2,894 homes left completely uninhabitable. Our aim is to help residents of the affected islands reconstruct their homes, rebuild their lives, and get back on their feet to pursue their future plans once again. All of us are friends, family members, co-workers, who suffered great loss at the hands of Dorian. But despite it all, most of them simply want to get back home and to get back on their feet. And it does not matter how many temporary housing facilities are made available. They want to get back into their own home. With the provisions under the sales order 2019, people affected by Dorian can rebuild their lives more affordably and with greater speed. The expensive list, in, uh, a sample of the approved items, the, the expensive list includes building supplies, hardware supplies, household furniture, furnishings and appliances, beds and bedding material, air conditioning units, plumbing and electrical fixtures. This list also includes clothing, personal hygiene products, unprepared food, unprepared food, miscellaneous supplies, and cleaning supplies. It is true, not every single consumer product is on the list of approved items. Alcohol, tobacco, wines, and spirits are not included on the list. Neither are confectionaries, including chocolates, candies, and gum. <laughs> Indeed, not every single product sold by specialty business will be covered under the order. <coughs> Additionally, services are not included under the order. However, the list is very expansive and was created to take care of the immediate and urgent needs of the people affected by the storm to rebuild their homes and restore normalcy to their lives. Just yesterday, representatives from the Ministry of Finance and the Department of Inland Revenue met with stakeholders in Grand Bahama to discuss the package of tax relief benefits that are included under the Sears order. We have already consulted with businesses in Abaco and have connected with businesses in New Providence as well. Rest assured, the dialogue with the public and community stakeholders will continue. Mr. Speaker, before I close, I want to speak briefly to the process we have to put in place, we have put in place for individuals and businesses to benefit from this order. First of all, the information about the Sears Order 2019 and the process is available on the Department of Inland Revenue's website, the Bahamas Budget website, and the Bahamas Customs website. The information will be available at all customs offices and the Department of Inland Revenue offices as well as Ministry of Finance offices. Indeed, the recovery zone, inside the recovery zone, there is no pre-approved requirement for VAT-free point of sale purchases. So you don't need, within the zone, you can go to any retailer and purchase the approved items without any pre-approval. The zone has been pre-approved. However, 
for all of the other tax breaks, there is a consolidated tax relief form that must be completed by individuals or businesses and submitted to the Ministry of Finance or Department of Inland Revenue for pre-approval. This form replaces all of the older forms and is available online at any Department of Inland Revenue or Customs Office. So in other words, if you're buying from a retailer or a supplier within the Abaco or Grand Bahama, you do not need pre-approval. But if you're importing something from foreign or from New Providence into the Special Economic Zone, you do need pre-approval in order to benefit from the exemption. And there's now one form where we had, I think it's four forms, form A, B, C, and D. We now only have one form that uh, applies for any import. Mr. Speaker, we understand that as much as we are trying to be progressive and to give incentive, there will be those who will try to take advantage of the system. I wish to reiterate that Hurricane Dorian left behind total damages, losses, and additional cost estimates at $3.4 billion. For the government, it was a stark reminder of our vulnerability as an island nation to climate change. Further, the impact has imposed a huge financial cost on the government, resulting in a revision of our fiscal projections and medium-term plans. In the recently tabled Fiscal Strategy, Strategy Report 2019, I pointed out that the government's total aggregate expenditure is estimated to increase by $302.6 million. These direct expenditures are compounded by an estimated $236 million in revenue losses on account of the disruption in business, act business activity on the affected islands of Abaco and Grand Bahama. Mr. Speaker, I raise these financial and econ economic realities to emphasize that the government's priority in the delivery of tax breaks is to the people in the special economic recovery zones of Grand Bahama and Abaco and the surrounding Keys. We will and we must have sufficient controls in place to prevent abuse. And we will apply the full weight of the law against those who would seek to take advantage of the system to the de detriment of those actually in need. This is not a universal tax holiday, and it is not a free for all. The package of tax breaks under the Sears Order 2019 are for the people of Grand Bahama and Abaco and the surrounding Keys. The Department of Inland Revenue, the Department of Customs, will be stepping up its enforcement and surveillance activities at all of our domestic ports to ensure that there is no attempt to import or to use these special economic zone areas to import and then transfer to areas outside of the economic zone for the benefit of residents outside of the economic zone without the applicable duty and tax being applied. So a word to the wise, to those who think they can beat the system. They will be detected and they will be prosecuted under the full weight of the law. It is important, Mr. Speaker, for me to say that because, again, as I indicated, the cost of this program is significant. The economic loss to the country is significant. And the expenditure is increased as a result of this disaster. And we cannot allow for any unauthorized leakages of revenue to go uh, without some check, without being in control. And so I just want to give that, that advice and warning to those who may decide that this is an opportunity to test the system. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Honorable Member. Honorable yeah. Member, you undertake to the table. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, the, the Chair recognizes the Honorable Member for Exomas and Ragan I, I wonder whether the, the Minister would speak to NGOs who may not have facilities or security in the designated zones, but they operate from New Providence, whether there is a process for them to make application 
so that they may import into New Providence uh, for the benefit of their work in Abaco and Grand Bahama, Mr. Speaker. Chair, the Chair recognizes the Honorable Member for East Grand Bahama. Sorry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, this was a question that has been raised to me yesterday and again this morning. Um, there is no current provision for a bonded warehouse uh, in New Providence to facilitate uh, movement of goods um, from foreign or from domestic sources to a facility uh, or an organization in New Providence for later supply to the islands affected. Uh, it is uh, something that we will look at to see whether we can um, uh, um, safely and, and uh, um, expeditiously um, monitor and manage such a situation. Um, we are very concerned that once we start to allow that kind of operation, that the opportunities for leakage is so great um, that it may not be something that we want to encourage. Um, but we will look at it on a case-by-case on -case basis to see whether uh, it is something we can facilitate. Because we do recognize that, uh, particularly for NGOs, there may be some, some challenge with respect to storage of goods uh, on the affected islands, particularly Abaco, where there is not many places where you can safely and securely uh, keep an inventory. Uh, so we will look at it. But we do not want to encourage that at all, Mr. Speaker, because again, it puts additional uh, a burden on the customs in particular uh, to, to surveil and to monitor these uh, uh, inventories to ensure that they are in fact uh, uh, delivered to the affected islands um, uh, rather than being consumed uh, uh, here in, in your province or in, in other parts of the country that is not intended to benefit from that particular incentive. Thank you, Honourable Member. Further statement and communication by ministers. Communications by the clerk. <laughs> Messages from the Governor General. Messages from the Senate. Honourable Members, just before we proceed to the next order of business, uh, I wish to indicate to members that I had the opportunity to visit with the General Manager of said an S yesterday, and we are pleased with uh, the cooperation of members with respect to uh, making the arrangements for the recording of the Christmas messages, and um, just a, a brief reminder that all those persons who have not yet recorded their message, ZNS would like for those confirmation of arrangements to be made by Friday. for leave of absence, leave to resign seat, and new rates. Oh, the chair recognizes the honorable member for Senate. At this point, at this point, I firmly deny the rumors that are going around in social media that I will be return resigning my seat. <laughs> so I stand to make sure that that rumor is false. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, Honorable Member since first announce, there is no motion then for leave of absence <laughs> to resign seat on your rights. Uh, presentation of petition. Presentation of reports of committees. Adoption of reports of committees. First reading of bills. The chair recognizes the honorable member for East Grand Bahama. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I beg leave to introduce my bread for the first time. A bill for an act to amend the Register of Beneficial Ownership Act 2018. Oh, thank you. Is there a second? Yeah. 
honorable members, it has been moved and seconded that the following bill be read for the first time. A bill for an act to amend the Register of Beneficial Ownership Act 2018. As many as are in favor will remain seated. Those who oppose will stand. Order that the bill be read for the first time. A bill for an act to amend the Register of Beneficial Ownership Act 2019. Further, first reading of bills. The chair recognizes the Honorable Member for East Grand Bahama. Mr. Speaker, I beg leave to lay and have read for the first time a bill for an act to amend the Excise Act. <coughs> Is there a second? Sorry. <clears throat> Honorable members, it has been moved and seconded that the following bill be read for the first time. A bill for an act to amend the Excise Act. As many as are in favor remain seated. Those who oppose will stand. Order that the bill be read for the first time. <clears throat> A bill for an act to amend the Excise Act. For the first reading of bills. The chair recognizes the Honorable Member for East Grand Bahama. Mr. Speaker, I beg leave to lay on the table of the House and have read for the first time a bill for an act to amend the Tariff Act. Sure. Is there a second? Yeah, man. You would love that, wouldn't you? <laughs> you wouldn't have the campaign anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Honorable members, it has been moved and seconded that the following bill be read for the first time. A bill for an act to amend the Tariff Act 2019. As many as are in favor will remain seated. Those who oppose will stand. Order that the bill be read for the first time. A bill for an act to amend the Tariff Act 2018. 2019. Okay, make a correct. 2019. Further first reading of bills. The chair recognizes the honorable member for East Grand Bahama. Mr. Speaker, before I, before I do that, I, there are members in the gallery. I don't know if you want to allow them in. Yes. Twenty twenty two isn't far away. <laughs> There's four seats there, you can pick one of them. <laughs> this week I beg leave to, to lay on the table of the house and I've read for the first time. A bill for an act to amend the first schedule to the Value Added Tax Act 2014 to make provision for the exemption of value added tax in certain instances. Is there a second? Yes. <laughs> Honorable members, it has been moved and seconded that the following bill be read for the first time. A bill for an act to amend the first schedule to the Value Added Tax Act 2014 to make provision for the exemption of value added tax in certain instances. As many as are in favor will remain seated. Those who oppose will stand. Order that the bill be read for the first time. A bill for an act to amend the first schedule to the Value Added Tax Act 2014 to make provision for the exemption of value added tax in certain instances. Further first reading of bills. Speaker, the chair recognizes the honorable member for East Grand Bahama. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I don't have another uh, act, but I just wanted to make sure we, we read into the record correctly the uh, bill that was laid, uh, the first bill that was laid. Right. Uh, there was a little confusion on the date. Yeah. Uh, the, it is a bill for an act to amend the Register of Beneficial Ownership Act 2018. Yes. Yeah. Just to make sure we have oh. Amending the 2018 Act. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, you change it to 
record keeping purposes the first bill that was read for the first time was a bill for an act to amend the register of beneficial ownership act 2018 for the first reading of bills second reading and committal of bills the chair recognizes the honorable member for three down. I have a why well, now with the rest of them gone. <laughs> 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 Mr. Speaker. I rise on behalf of the great people of Freetown to move the Aircraft Accident Investigation Authority Bill 2019, accompanied by the Aircraft Accident Investigation Authority Regulations 2019. Mr. Speaker, these are two very uncontroversial pieces of legislation. As such, I expect the full support of all members of this House since what we are attempting to do today is to keep our aviation legislation relevant and in step with the rest of the world. <laughs> Simply put, Mr. Speaker, this bill and accompanying regulations seek to update, update the country's aviation legislation that govern the investigation of air accidents, incorporating changes that would have been recommended by the United Nations International Civil Aviation Organization. Before I get to the meat of my presentation, Mr. Speaker, I want to take this opportunity, since today will probably be the last time I speak in this place for 2019, to thank my constituents for allowing me to represent them in the House of Assembly of the Parliament of the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. Mr. Speaker, I have an awesome responsibility in representing my constituents, and it is not a responsibility that I take lightly. I enjoy the challenge, I forge numerous wonderful friendships with my constituents, and hope that they agree that the rep representation that I have provided them, while by no means perfect, has been acceptable to them. In 2020, the beginning of a new decade, I promise to do better, provide even better representation, and ultimately contribute to an improved quality of life and more opportunities for all the residents of Freetown. As we approach the end of the year, just 27 days to go. I want to take this opportunity to wish all the residents of Freetown a very Merry Christmas and best wishes for a healthy and prosperous new year. Mr. Speaker, what these two pieces of legislation seek to do is to incorporate into domestic legislation the 2016 and 2018 amendments to Annex 13 of the Convention on International Civil Aviation. These amendments <clears throat> Amendment 15 and 16 to Annex 13 of the Convention on International Civil Aviation have been adopted by the United Nations International Civil Aviation Organization, or referred to as ICAO. As a result, and because we are a member state of ICAO, we are expected to update our domestic legislation to incorporate these amendments to Annex 13, and that, Mr. Speaker, is exactly what we are doing here today. Specifically, Mr. Speaker, what we are doing here today is repealing Part 8 of the Civil Aviation Act 2016 and replacing it with the proposed Aircraft Accident Investigation Authority Bill 2019. In addition, we are also repealing the Civil Aviation Investigation of Air Accidents and Incidents Regulations 2017 as amended and replacing them with the Aircraft Accident Investigation Authority Regulations 2019. Mr. Speaker, I know that this is fairly dry and technical stuff. And quite frankly, I don't expect any sensational or salacious headlines to emerge from my contribution to this debate. <laughs> also, with the use of these aviation-related acronyms and abbreviations, I fully expect it to get a bit overwhelming. I will try, therefore, Mr. Speaker, to keep my presentation as simple and as easy to understand as I can, but apologize in advance if at times I find it necessary to slip into the aviation jargon 
to make my point. Mr. Speaker, to get a full understanding of why these pieces of legislation are required, I will provide members with a brief breakdown into the body that governs global aviation standards and best practices and governs also this particular Annex 13 on aircraft accidents and incidents. Mr. Speaker, the International Civil Aviation Organization, ICAO, is a United Nations specialized agency established by its member states in 1944 to manage the administration and governance of global aviation. Mr. Speaker, as you can imagine, aviation involves not only flying within a particular country, but also involves, involves flying from one country to another country. So the world, through the United Nations, recognized back in 1944 <laughs> that it was sheer madness for each country to have its own separate rules and regulations governing aviation. The world recognized that for aviation to work and to thrive and to flourish, there must be a standard set of rules to govern aviation. And so when the United Nations created the International Civil Aviation Organization in 1944, that body immediately created the world's aviation rules known as the Convention on International Civil Aviation. And since this convention was crafted in Chicago, it is known as the Chicago <coughs> Convention. The Bahamas became a member of ICAO in 1975, shortly after independence, and signed on to the Chicago Convention at that time. Presently, there are 193 countries who have signed on to the Chicago Convention. ICAO works with each of these 193 member states and industry groups to reach a consensus on international civil aviation standards and recommended practices, SARPs, and policies. These SARPs, standards, and recommended practices and policies are crafted in support of a safe, efficient, secure, economically sustainable, and environmentally responsible civil aviation sector. <coughs> These SARPs and policies are also used by ICAO member states to ensure that their local civil aviation operations and regulations conform to global norms, which in turn permits flights in aviation's, in, in, in aviation's global network to operate safely and reliably in every region of the world. You see, Mr. Speaker, ICAO, in fulfilling its mission to ensure a safe and efficient civil aviation sector, will never overtly force a member country to adopt its standards and recommended practices. However, if you're a signatory to the Chicago Convention, as we are, ICAO will, from time to time, visit your country and audit your effective implementation of its standards and recommended practices. They then publish on their website the results of your most recent audit by giving you an, an, an effective implementation score for all the world to see. Naturally, no country wants a low score, since that may negatively impact the development of its aviation sector. So while you're not forced to improve your effective implementation score, there is significant, significant pressure to do so. ICAO standards and recommended practices for each of ICAO's responsibility are contained in 19 annexes. Each annex deals with a particular subject area. All are subject to regular amendment, and the details in respect of many of the annexes are contained in publications called the ICAO document series. ICAO manages the uniform global implementation of its annexes through its No Country Left Behind initiative. The No Country Left Behind initiative ensures that the standards and recommended practices implementation is harmonized globally. Proper implementation of these SARPs are verified through oversight audits performed by ICAO auditors. In the safety domain, these audits are carried out under the Universal Safety Oversight Audit Program, while in the security domain, a similar Universal Security Audit Program is used. These audits are restricted to looking and studying only the legislation, resources, and other capacities which member country establish in order to effectively implement ICAO's standards and recommended practices in each area. This leads us to directly into why the bill and regulations being presented today are necessary. During the period the 23rd to the 3rd of November 2017, the Bahamas was the subject of an ICAO safety audit 
which found that the Accident Investigation Department largely non-compliant with the standards and recommended practices of Annex 13 to the Chicago Convention. The Civil Aviation Act and regulations in force did not address the latest amendments, 15 and 16, to Annex 13. Due to the lack of compliance with Annex 13 in the country's legislation and regulations, ICAO's effective implementation score for the Accident Investigation Group decreased from 79% to a mere 19%. <coughs> Since the results of the audit were made known, and they are published for all the world to see on ICAO's website, the Air Accident Investigation Department swooped into action and completed a corrective action plan which addressed every standard and recommended practice of Amendments 15 and 16 to Annex 13, and that resulted in the drafting of the proposed bill and regulations before you today. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to recommend, recognize the members of the Air Accident Investigation Department who are seated in the gallery. And it is they, under the leadership of their eminently qualified, but sadly absent, Delvin Major, who will become the founding, who will become the founding employees of the Air Accident Investigation Authority when and if the House sees fit to pass and enact this bill. Mr. Speaker, I have been impressed by the training and proud of the quality of the investigative work performed by this group, and I wish them Godspeed and best wishes as they leave the Ministry of Aviation for the Ministry of Transport, a step that this bill deems necessary to ensure independence and remove any conflict of interest as it relates to the investigation of air accidents. More on that later. In the, in the forward of Annex 13, at page Roman numeral 11, under the heading Action by Contracting States and subheading Use of the Text of the Annex in National Regulations, it states, and I quote, the Council on the 13th of April 1948 adopted a resolution inviting the attention of contracting states to the desirability of using in their own national regulations as far as practical the precise language of those ICAO standards and are of regulatory character and also of, indicate, and also of indicating departures from the standards, including any additional national regulations that were important for the safety or regularity of air navigation. However, the SARPs of Annex 13, while of general applicability, will in many cases require amplification in order to enable a complete national code to be formulated." End quote. The 2016 and 2018 amendments by the International Civil Aviation Organization, ICAO, to Annex 13 became applicable to all 193 member states on the 10th of November 2016 and on the 8th of November 2018, respectively. The 2016 amendment, Amendment 15, to ICAO's Annex 13 is aimed at, one, establishing independent aircraft accident investigation authorities. Two, adding new provisions on cooperation between investigation authorities and judicial authorities. <laughs> Three, enhancing the protection of investigation records. And four, the designation of a competent authority whose responsibility it is to determine whether records gathered during the process of accident or incident investigation can be released for any purposes other than safety investigation. The 2018 amendment, Amendment 16, to ICAO's Annex 13 is aimed at, one, ensuring that investigation authorities have unrestricted and timely access to evidential material during the conduct of investigations, and two, ensuring the implementation of monitoring procedures to track actions in response to safety recommendations, resulting in a positive impact on safety and on the collection, analysis, and sharing of safety risks. Since ICAO, through Amendment 15 to Annex 13, has now mandated that all contracting states establish an independent accident investigation authority, we are seeking to comply with that requirement with this legislation. The legislation creates an Air Accident Investigation Authority which shall be functionally independent from all other state aviation authorities and other entities that could interfere with the conduct or objectivity of an investigation. For example, Mr. Speaker, to ensure the complete independence of the Air Accident Investigation Authority, this bill will remove the authority from the oversight of the Minister of Aviation and place it under the purview of the Minister of Transport. If the PLP were to ever become the government again, <laughs> and do what they have always done, which is coupled transport with aviation, 
then the Air Accident Investigation Authority will be moved to tourism. Mr. Speaker, the bottom line is that whichever minister has responsible for aviation, he or she cannot have responsibility for the Air Accident Investigation Authority. This change in the reporting lines of the authority have been reviewed and is fully supported by ICAO through the assistance it rendered to this legislation via its No Country Left Behind initiative. This move will ensure that there is no actual or perceived conflict of interest in the event an accident or incident occurs involving an entity under the purview of the minister with responsibility for aviation. <coughs> for example, an accident may have occurred through some oversight or failure by the civil aviation authorities or by the air traffic control department, both of which fall under the purview of the minister of aviation. If the air accident investigation authority were to remain under the remit of the minister of aviation and they reveal to him or her <coughs> that an air accident occurred because of some deficiency by civil aviation or air traffic control, then you can all see the potential conflict that that would cause the minister. So with the enactment of this bill, that conflict disappears. Mr. Speaker, in review of the existing legislation, we have considered and based the proposed legislation on a number of reference documents, including but not limited to the following. The Convention on International Civil Aviation 1944, Annex 13 to the Convention on International Civil Aviation, Amendments 15 and 16 to Annex 13, ICAO's Model Accident Investigation Authority Act, ICAO's Model Accident Investigation Authority Regulations, and ICAO's Manual on Protection of Safety Information, Document 10053. Consideration was given to the comments of local, regional, and global industry stakeholders and accident investigation le legislation of Barbados, Jamaica, the Dominican Republic, Mexico, and the United Kingdom. The proposed Accident Investigation Authority legislation incorporates all the desired policy and legislative changes envisioned in Amendment 15, mainly by, one, establishing the Air Accident Investigation Authority and its functional independence, sections five and six of the bill, <laughs> establishing how the authority and the relevant departments of the government are to interact during investigations, section 12, its designation of the competent authorities, and their role in protecting records and administering a balancing test <laughs> to determine if the record should be released for reasons other than safety, sections 20 and 21, providing protection against investigators being compelable to appear as witnesses in any judicial, administrative, or disciplinary proceedings relating to apportioning blame or liability of an accident, section 22, and describing the procedures for the protection and dissemination of reports, sections 24, 25, and 26. The proposed Accident Investigation Authority legislation incorporates <laughs> all of the desired policy and legislative changes envisioned in Amendment 16, mainly by, one, the adoption of new procedures as it relates to access to evidential material during the investigation. This is achievable by the designation of the competent authorities, Regulation 1.165, subsection B, and their role in protecting records and administering a balancing <laughs> test to determine if the record should be released for reasons other than safety, that's sections 20 and 21 of the bill. The adoption of new practices related to monitoring the progress of actions taken in response to safety recommendations. This is to be achieved by the provisions of section 27 of the bill and subdivision 3, safety recommendations regulation 1.400, 1.405, and 1.410 of the draft regulation, of the proposed regulation. These provisions enable that the Air Accident Investigation Authority <coughs> to send safety recommendations to the relevant authorities and aviation st st stakeholders who must in return submit to the authority details of the steps to be taken to implement the safety recommendations and a timetable for, for doing so or explanation if no action will be taken to the safety recommendations. The proposed regulations are intended to expound clearly and informatively on the provisions of the proposed act by including the recommendations and guidance given by ICAO's Safety Information Protection Task Force and Group of Experts on Protection of Accident and Incident Records on how to execute the functions of the authority, the cooperation between the authority and relevant government and judicial bodies, the delineation between the roles of the competent authorities, and the powers and procedures for both local and international investigations, investigators and observers. The subject areas covered by the regulations are A, general applicability, B, personal responsibility accident reporting, C, accident and incident investigation, 
D, responsibility of investigating state. E, right of participation in investigation. F, entitlement of accredited representatives. G, foreign investigations. H, preservation of wreckage and records. I, accident reports. Uh, subdivision two, accident or incident data report. Subdivision one, preliminary report. Subdivision three, safety recommendations. Subdivision four, final report. Subpart J, voluntary occurrence reporting. The regulations also contain appendices that give guidance on areas such as Appendix 1, guidance for the determination of aircraft damage. Appendix 2, list of examples of serious incidences. Appendix 3, objective of protecting certain accidents. Appendix 4, records subject to protection. Appendix 5, designation of a competent authority. Appendix 6, administration of the balancing tests. Appendix 7, rights and obligations of the state of the operator in respect of accidents and incidences involving lease, chartered, or interchange aircraft. Appendix A, guidelines for flight recorder readout and analysis. Appendix 9, interactions between the media and the accident investigation authority. And Appendix 10, types of records generation, generated or obtained during an investigation. So you can see we've covered everything. During the ICAO No Country Left Behind program mission visit, <coughs> conducted from the 8th 18th to the 20th of February 2019 by a Mr. Mark St. Laurent, <clears throat> consultant for ICAO's North American, Central American, and Caribbean Regional Office. He noted that once this proposed draft legislation and regulations before you today are promulgated and gazetted, the Bahamas Aircraft Accident Investigations leg legislative regime would have effectively satisfied 99 of the 103 safety audit protocol questions. Raising our safety audit score on air accidents from its present 19% to a much more impressive 96%. These results will be made official when another oversight audit of the safety domain of our aviation sector is completed by ICAO, which is now planned for March of 2021. Our last full audit was completed in October 2017. And sadly, the Bahamas' effective implementation of ICAO standards and recommended practices in each area covered by the Universal Safety Oversight Audit, audit Program was not acceptable. Since that audit in 2017, and knowing that another full audit is due in 2021, the Bahamas Civil Aviation Authorities are now in high gear to improve its effective implementation score. In addition, this government has already expressed a desire to launch an aircraft registry. In order to successfully launch that aircraft registry, it is necessary to improve ICAO's effective implementation score since no one wants to register their aircraft in a jurisdiction with a low score. As a result, the government has executed an agreement with the Aviation Registration Group out of Miami to assist as a first step in significantly improving that effective implementation score and thereby provide the necessary solid foundation in our aviation sector to successfully launch our new aircraft registry. Since our next full audit is a mere 15 months away, we have a lot to do to get all our ducks in a row to ensure a much, much higher score. As accident investigation is one of the technical areas that will be assessed by ICAO to ensure compliance with the standards and recommended practices, the proposed legislation and regulations before you today and all its subsequent documentation, policies, and procedures will aid in effectively mitigating the previous findings ident identified by ICAO in the last audit of 2017 and assist greatly in improving our effective implementation score. With the assistance of the Aircraft Registry Group, the passage of this bill and its accompanying regulations is the conscientious second step being taken by the government in the aviation sector legislative update and overhaul process. The first step being the plethora of new aviation le legislation that was passed in 2016 that essentially set up the Bahamas' modern aviation sector regime. Thank you, Englishman. Mr. Speaker. I can't even get a smile. <laughs> I put that in there for you. I put that in there for you to get a smile. At least a smile, man. Get a smile, man. Just to get a smile. <laughs>
Yeah, she, she was too busy, too busy writing something bad about me. Yeah, don't go over the bridge. Don't go over the bridge. That's what you're thinking. Uh, yeah, yeah, man. Okay, relax yourself now. And then you could go into Uban. Okay. As well as we are all aware, as, as well, Mr. Speaker, as we are all aware, over the course of the last few years, the Bahamas has seen a number of unfortunate air accidents and incidences, some sadly resulting in fatalities. Investigations have naturally followed all of these accidents, and those investigations have placed a negative spotlight on some of the agencies of government that are required to assist the accident investigation team in carrying out their functions. With the passage of this bill, Memorandum of Understandings, MOUs, will now be executed between the Air Accident Investigation Authority and those other government agencies for greater cooperation during accident investigation. I can assure you, Mr. Speaker, that the Accident Investigation Department is staffed with competent and qualified investigators who have worldwide knowledge and experience. Some, if not all, of the investigators have received extensive training alongside some of the best investigation agencies and institutions in the world including the National Transportation Safety Board, the NTSB, and the Federal Aviation Administration, FAA, in the United States, the Transportation Safety Board in Canada, and other fine institutions such as the University of Southern California, Singapore Aviation Academy, ICAO Regional in Mexico, and ICAO Headquarters in Montreal, Canada, and many other accident investigation <laughs> institutions. These investigators bring a wealth of experience and qualifications to the department. The bill and regulations before you today will now give them the added authority and powers to put into effect some of that training they have acquired and carry out the functions mandated by the latest amendments to Annex 13. Mr. Speaker, while the laws currently in force for the Accident Investigation Department exists, they are, severely they are severely inadequate to effectively carry out accident investigations in compliance with the latest amendments of Annex 13. Provisions included in this bill such as the authority for the Accident Investigation Unit to request and retain the assistance of search and rescue and other governmental ag agencies until such time as they are released by the Accident Investigation Unit is paramount and addressed in the bill before you today. We have seen in the past where, as a result of the lack of this authority to compel agencies that responded to remain in place and assist the investigation team adequately in such time as they are released, a less than ideal outcome has been the result. <laughs> With the passage of this bill and regulations before you today, that will be no more, since the Air Accident Investigation Authority will now have the authority and MOUs in place to ensure adequate search and rescue and other required governmental agencies are available to render assistance until such time as they, are de as they deem necessary. Mr. Speaker, I now will explain the particular sections of the bill. Part one of the bill seeks to set out the preliminary matters of the bill, including the objective of the act. Part two of the bill seeks to establish the Aircraft and Accident Investigation Authority and its functions and powers relating to the investigation of aircraft in accidents and incidents. <laughs> Part three of the bill seeks to provide for the responsibilities of the minister with responsibility for aircraft accident and incident investigations and to provide for the appointment of a chief investigator who will act as the appointed head of the authority and the designation of investigator in charge in respect of each aircraft accident and incident investigations. <coughs> Part 4 of the bill seeks to provide for the investigation of aircraft accidents and incidences and the voluntary reporting by persons or organizations on the, on the occurrences of an aircraft accident or incident. Clause 11 provides for the empowerment of the chief investigator to apply for exemption from customs duties in respect of goods, vehicles and equipment required for investigative purposes. Clause 12 of the bill seeks to establish the authority's sole jurisdiction to investigate aircraft accidents and incidents, but provides that the authority may refer matters for investigation by other government departments and agencies. Further, Clause 12 seeks to provide that a government department or law enforcement agency may, investi may investigate an <laughs> aircraft accident or incident for any other purpose than that which is provided by this Act. Clauses 13, 14, and 15 provide for the voluntary reporting of information relating to aircraft accidents and incidents and the assurance against non-prosecution where a person or organization so reports or discloses such information. Clause 16 of the bill seeks to obligate an aircraft owner, an aircraft operator, a pilot in command, crew members, and the operator of an airport who have knowledge of an aircraft accident or incident to report the same by the quickest mean available, means available. 
Clause 17 of the bill seeks to provide for the extent of an investigation carried out in accordance with the Act. Clause 18 of the bill seeks to provide for the functional cooperation of the Bahamas Civil Aviation Authority and the Aircraft Accident Investigation Authority with regard to information necessary to assist an investigation and the reporting of information obtained during an investigation that will result in a change of civil aviation regulations or operational procedures. Clause 19 and 20 of the bill seek to provide for the preservation of evidence and protection of records obtained during an investigation. The rules governing the disclosure of records obtained during an investigation are to be determined following the administration of a balancing test conducted by the competent authority as provided in Clause 21. Clause 22 provides that investigators or members of the authority are not compelable as witnesses or to provide expert opinion in any judicial or administrative proceedings, whether criminal or civil, <coughs> of which the object is to determine and apportion blame or liability for an aircraft accident or incident. So this department is not going to get into who is guilty and who is not. They just make their report. Clause 23 provides the circumstances under which an, investigator, an investigation may be reopened. Part 5 of the bill provides for the preparation and release of reports and safety recommendations and to whom such reports and recommendations are to be made. Provision is also made for the confidentiality of such reports or recommendations where information contained therein relates to voluntary reporting by a person or organization in accordance with the Act. <coughs> Part 6 of the bill seeks to provide for miscellaneous provisions, including a general penalty in respect of any contravention of the bill, the empowerment of the minister to make regulations, and the repeal of Part 8 of, of the Civil Aviation Act 2016. Mr. Speaker, one other small advantage of passing this bill and accompanying regulations is that it fulfills one of the requirements that the Inter-American Development Bank, IDB, has put in place in order to secure the balance of funds made available under the air transport reform loan. As mentioned, when all facets of the aviation sector were audited, back, were audited by AKO back in 2017, a number of areas were identified as deficient. Even though the air transport reform loan was made available prior to the ICAO audit, when the results of the ICAO audit were made available on its website for all the world to see, the IDB latched onto these poor results, requiring further conditions be met in order to secure the balance on the $50 million loan it had made available to the government of the Bahamas to improve the regulatory environment of its aviation sector. <clears throat> By passing this bill, another condition of that loan will be, now be met and delivered. Finally, Mr. Speaker, <coughs> I would like to thank Mr. Ryan Sands. A young attorney, Stan, a young attorney in the Attorney General's office <laughs> for the huge amount of assistance that he would have provided me in preparing and now moving this important piece of legislation. Mr. Speaker, I ain't no lawyer. So I needed an enormous amount of assistance in bringing this legislation to this place. Mr. Sands was assigned to this project, and I would be remiss if I did not personally thank him for all the work he did to prepare the legislation, present it to Cabinet, incorporate the recommended changes by all the interested parties, and assist me in explaining the purpose and necessity of this legislation as I have done today. I'm convinced that his work on this legislation triggered a keen interest in the law of aviation, since Mr. Sands has since left the office of the Attorney General <laughs> and is now employed in the legal department of the Bahamas Civil Aviation Authority, which is the regulatory body for all matters aviation in the Bahamas. <laughs> once again, <laughs> yeah. once, once again, ain't nothing wrong with that. You got to do what you got to do. <laughs> once again, thank you, Mr. Ryan Sands, for all your work on this important piece of legislation, and good luck with your new career at the BCAA. In closing, Mr. Speaker, Freetown moves. The Aircraft Accident Investigation Authority Bill 2019 accompanied by the Aircraft Accident Investigation Authority Regulations 29, and takes this moment to wish once again all the constituents of Freetown a very Merry Christmas and best wishes for a healthy and prosperous <laughs> New Year. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank, thank you, Honorable Member. Is there a seconder? The Chair recognizes the Honorable Member for Bamboo Town. <laughs> so, oh, some, 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 <laughs> that's what I offer right now. <laughs> Not much. <laughs>
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As always, I give praise to the King Eternal, Immortal, Invisible, the only wise God, to whom there's glory, honor, majesty, dominion, and power forever. Amen. Mr. Speaker, I rise to second the passing of this bill and its regulations, as it will symbolize the beginning of a new era in the Bahamian aviation industry. Mr. Speaker, simply put, the Air Accident Investigation Authority must be separated from Civil Aviation Authority to prevent conflicts of interest. Maintaining independence in the conduct of investigations is of the utmost to avoid situations that have the potential to create conflicts of interest. Mr. Speaker, it is essential, therefore, to implement an honest, unfettered, and fair system of fact-finding that uncovers the truth <laughs> and to maintain a process that protects the rights of all involved. That is the purpose of this bill. The transferring of this authority to the Ministry of Transport and Local Government also brings with it certain powers and certain responsibilities. To accomplish this, the bill defines the minister as the minister responsible for transport, where he or she is not the minister responsible for civil aviation, or a minister who is not also the minister responsible for civil aviation in the future. As the establishment of the Air Accident Investigation Authority, we will then begin at the establishment of the Air Accident Investigation Authority. We will then begin the process of agreeing several MOUs, as was spoken to by the Minister of Tourism, between the newly formed authority and other bodies needed to execute the functions of an effective aircraft accident investigation program. This will require participation with the police, the defense force, BASRA, NEMA, several NGOs, the, ju the judiciary, and in worst case scenarios, the coroner's office. Additionally, with the legislative outlay set to happen for the sector in mid-2020, the Aircraft Accident Authority will continue to develop, and we're looking forward to it, Mr. Speaker. As we are coming out ahead of the game, during that period, we will use the expertise of the visiting aviation experts to assist in the development of additional policies, procedures, and manuals to ensure that the Bahamas has the highest quality of air accident response team in the region and, Mr. Speaker, I dare say, the world. Mr. Speaker, this bill and its accompanying regulations will bring our air accident legislation up to date and set the foundation to remedy several issues facing our developing aviation industry. And uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm not gonna go through the list. My team had created a list here. But again, the Minister of Tourism had gone through that list, so I'm going to skip over that. Mr. Speaker, and simply say, investigations are complex, and while the Air Accident Authority team strives to complete investigations and issue reports as quickly as possible, they must take the time necessary to conduct thorough investigations to advance aviation safety, and I'm sure they will do so. While we in the public may be clamoring for answers right away as to what caused an accident or an incident, we must be cognizant of the fact that, though complex in most instances, care and attention must be paid to investigations in order that aviation safety may be advanced based on the findings of those investigations and the safety recommendations issued as a result of those findings. Mr. Speaker, there are three main phases of accident investigations. The field phase, the examination and analysis phase, and the reporting phase. Mr. Speaker, I now undertake to give a brief summary of those phases. In the field phase, the decision having been made to investigate a team of investigators is assembled with an investigator in charge and other relevant investigators. The makeup of the team depends on the nature of the occurrence and the Air Accident Investigation Authority, Authority normally informs the public of this dispatch and arrival to the occurrence site. Once on the site, the team secures, examines, and takes photographs of the site, equipment, or wreckage. The team members conduct preliminary interviews of witnesses, select wreckage to be removed for further analysis, collect other pertinent information, 
and determine the relevance of documents. Mr. Speaker, during the second phase, the examination and analysis phase, the team reviews pertinent records, tests selected components and system of the wreckage in the lab, read and analyze recorders and other data if available, review autopsy and toxicology reports, conduct further interviews, determines the sequence of events, and identify safety deficiencies. When safety deficiencies are suspected or confirmed, the Air Accident Investigation Authority will advise the appropriate authority without waiting until publication of the final report. During this phase, Mr. Speaker, an update to the public is also given. Mr. Speaker, in the third phase, the reporting phase, which involves the, the, the preparation of a confidential draft report. This report is then sent to persons and corporations who are directly concerned by the report for their review and contributions. They then have the opportunity to dispute or correct information they believe to, been, to be inaccurate. The Accident Investigation Authority, Mr. Speaker, will consider all representations and make any required amendments before approving the draft report as an approved final report. Mr. Speaker, once the final report is approved, is approved, this final report is released to the public and also available on the Air Accident Investigation official website. Mr. Speaker, be assured that when serious safety deficiencies are uncovered during any investigation, there is no delay waiting for the final report to address them. They are made known right away to the relevant authority or industry partners to correct or address as necessary to avoid future accidents or incidents. Mr. Speaker, while the responsibility of the regulator is to ensure that regulations are updated and that they are followed, the accident investigation process looks beyond compliance in most instances to determine if <laughs> the regulatory framework is adequate. Mr. Speaker, conflicts of interest arise if both accident investigation and regulatory function is the purview of the same minister, as was said earlier. While one department is investigating the actions or inactions of another department under the same ministry. This standard of ICAO, Amendment 15 to Annex 13, requires the removal of actually or perceived conflicts of interest as it relates to accident investigations. Mr. Speaker, this, despite our best efforts, unfortunately, accidents do occur. We cannot predict them, but in most cases, Mr. Speaker, we can prevent them. When investigations identify safety deficiencies, which, if addressed, will reduce the risk of similar occurrence and advance safety in aviation. It is incumbent on those entities to issue safety recommendations and to address them in a timely manner. Mr. Speaker, this is another reason why this bill is necessary. As currently the regulations in force do not meet the latest amendments to Annex 13 of ICAO, which mandates that entities issue safety recommendations address them in a timely manner, and to avoid future accidents or incidents. Mr. Speaker, the passage of this piece of legislation and accompanying regula regulations will set the Bahamas apart as one of few states within the North and Central America and the Caribbean region of ICAO, whose legal framework, Mr. Speaker, allows for a full, independent, and functional aircraft investigation authority. Mr. Speaker, I want to echo the sentiment of my colleague proposal, who mourns the loss of lives that we have suffered through aircraft accidents over the years here in the Bahamas. My seconding of this resolution is, well, my seconding of this bill and regulations is therefore emphatic, as this bill is critical to ensuring the safety and security of our Bahamalan and the Bahamian people. And Mr. Speaker, I want to say I thank you I move this most important and necessary legislation. I second 
this most important legislation. Thank you again, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Honorable Member. Honorable Members, it has been moved and seconded. That the following bill be read for a second time and committed. A bill for an act to establish the Aircraft Accident Investigation Authority of the Bahamas and codify the laws and regulations related to the conduct of investigation into aircraft accidents and incidents in the Bahamas or concerning Bahamian registered aircraft. <coughs> As many? The Chair recognizes the Honorable Member for Anglesen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, I rise on behalf of the good people of Anglesen who have sent me here to hold the line to represent their interests and to do so without fear or favor. And Mr. Speaker, as my father used to always say, I pray that I will never let them down. Mr. Mr. Speaker, the, um, the opposition supports this bill. Indeed. They want me to sit down now. Um, <laughs> Mr. Speaker, it, it, it mirrors in many uh, respects um, the provisions of the previous regime, but as pointed out, it, it differs in one fundamental respect, and it is that there it is being removed from the jurisdiction of the Minister of Aviation. I believe that most other functions have been moved from the Minister of Aviation, Bahamas Air Navigation Civil um, Services um, Division, etc. Uh, but there were two areas that stayed in the office of the Minister. One is the policy making, and the other is this particular function. This, um, and, and the bill promotes as the, um, as the regulations did, uh, the tenant of safety as, as, as a fundamental tenet of aviation um, uh, investigations and the findings of investigations. The, um, the minister mentioned that there are some regulations and he's not laid them because I note that the act, the, the bill that's before us has, a, has similarities to the, reg the, the, the current regulations. And so I'd be very interested to see how the regulations will supplement the bill itself. And we will, we will wait to see that. Um, I had one concern about it, and it's the provision of Clause 4, which speaks about the objective. And this was not in the prior regulations. But it states that final reports out of accident investigations shall not be used as evidence in any court proceeding, shall not be used as evidence in any court proceeding or in other proceedings related to apportioning blame or liability. That, that's probably civil litigation. And it's saying final reports shall not be used. And then it says no finding cause or contributing factor determined under this act shall be construed as assigning fault or determining civil or criminal liability. And um, that, that the, in particular, the first part of that is not found in the regulations. And it seems to be, in some regards, a policy shift and I want to, and I, the attorney is here, to raise the case of Rogers and Hoyle, which is a court of appeal um, case in the United Kingdom, which I believe is still the leading case in a, a uh, judgment delivered on the 13th of March, 2014, which, where the court of appeal rejected the appeal uh, on all grounds, confirming the first instance decision that their air accident and investi investigation board report, or the accident investigation uh, board report is, ad is admissible in evidence both as to the facts it contains and as to expert op opinion advice. And so I want, the, um, I want to point that out and to, to invite you to look at that carefully uh, because uh, you're suggesting that in a civil litigation where there, is, there, may, be, there may be a claim of negligence that um, these findings, these technical findings, cannot be introduced or used in any proceedings. And as, I, as I've indicated, in the United Kingdom, 
that has been overruled and they've taken a very different approach jurisprudentially and this was not the position taken in the prior regulations. Um, but I do understand that the underlying philosophy of the, of the, of the investigation is for the, for the department or the authority is not to assign blame but to promote safety. And so we appreciate that. But th this is the other side of the coin, and I'm inviting you to, um, to look at that. The member spoke about the findings of um, an audit. And the member will find, um, and he, he has already found, because I know he's had an audit since he took office, and he knew the outcome of that was um, very challenging. I chose not to uh, make public proclamations <coughs> about it, because um, aviation is an evolving um, industry. The standards evolve. When, this, when, when the regulations were brought, they were um, approved by our consultants, including um, those at the IKO. Um, the same technical people um, who fundamentally advised this minister advised us. And at the time, it was deemed to be sufficient to take that department or that agency into the remit of the office of the Minister of Aviation. It's now being moved into the Minister of Transport. Truthfully, um, there, it's still the political directorate, so, but if, if, if it's been accepted, as what we did was accepted at the time, if it's accepted, then we do not argue with it. But certainly, um, technically, you can, you can perceive conflicts all the way up if you wish. But, the, but you know, I, I don't wish to pursue that argument because it has been accepted as, as um, a um, acceptable um, structure um, to the, the mischief. But, um, and so I want to invite the minister to appreciate that aviation standards are evolving. There's no on a white horse and I reach and I fix in this. You are going to be continuously challenged in aviation. Continuously. <laughs> continuously. <laughs> it's capital oh, intensive. Minister. It's capital intensive. And it's, it's evolving. And a lot of the times, Mr. Speaker, it evolves because, Mr. Speaker, a lot of the times it evolves because because of accidents and, and other, um, other, um, other accidents play a large role in, in moving standards. The standards will evolve. They're not stagnant. And so I appreciate that the member for, um, for Bamboo Town, I think, appreciated that. And I noted it in his contribution. No, you didn't. Uh, you, you, uh, you let off on that. But he appreciated it. <clears throat> and so I too want to thank all of the technical people who are still there, who assisted me so greatly um, during my tenure. Uh, you know, the, the, um, the, the, the lady of Paradise Island said, come get it. <laughs> She's waiting on you. <laughs> She's waiting. <clears throat> She's waiting for you. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the, um, the, the foundation of this amendment is, as the member um, has so um, generously conceded or, or noted, that it was the reform of the aviation sector. And um, the, 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 the aviation sector is truthfully um, a, a significant engine for our economic development, particularly for an archipelago, for a tourism-based economy. It is critical. It's critical for any nation, but for us, it is, it is peculiarly critical. We have 29 airports. It's also very challenging. So it's critical and challenging. And standards are evolving. And it's capital intensive. So you have to work really every day to keep it moving. The, the hallmark of the Christie administration, I have to give um, the former prime minister credit because he supported wholly and fully, as minister of finance, he understood it. Um, the, the work that was being undertaken for, the, for the, um, the reformation of the aviation sector in this country. And it indeed led to the modernization of the Bahamas aviation sector. Hundreds of millions of dollars, Mr. Speaker, was spent. You know, they asked where the VAT money gone. They were asking that then. But if they had monitored and watched what was happening, it would have given them some insight as to where taxpaying dollars were going in this country. The Civil Aviation Department at the time um, provided all aspects of, civil, of the civil aviation. It at the same time, but it was required at the same time to independently regulate and bring oversight. It's not, it was not possible. It was limping along and very difficult, and um, it was just not possible to do. And so reform had to come. It was long overdue. 
and they would and it led to this distinct separation of function. The Bahamas Civil Aviation Authority was mandated, was created um, with a board, and it's mandated to regulate the highest security and safety standards. The Bahamas Air Navigation Services Division deals, uh, addresses or manages air traffic management in the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. The airport authority has responsibility for the growth and development of 29 airports. And then a new department was created for aviation policy, and um, which is very important because things like drones, licensing of drones, um, types of cell phones. At one point, we had to deal with types of cell phones being banned on aircraft. It is a way in which aviation can keep abreast of evolving norms and issues. It's, an, it's, a, it's a very dynamic industry. And um, that was created, and that, that's in the office of the minister. And um, just on the issue of the board, because I know this authority has a board. When I brought the suite of legislation to separate function and modernize the aviation sector, the then, mem the then um, leader of the opposition, who was a member from Kalani, he criticized um, the government at the time for creating the board, um, at, and, or any board. I think we had, might have been one or two boards, or one board that came out of that. And he said that it was, an, it was a way of which we were creating posts for friends, family, and lovers. And I, I'm, I'm just interested to see now. We, hmm? I, well, I don't know, we, 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 we're now creating another board, um, and then we had one last week. So if that is what the member thinks, boards are for, then we have to wonder whether, because I don't think it like that, but we, he disclosed or betrayed his thinking about what boards are for. And so we have to, you know, I, I, I was, uh, we have to watch very carefully all these boards and to see what comes out of them, yeah. Sorry? Sorry? I guess you can think of the board. Oh, you can go with us, okay. Yeah. Um, and and the, a lot of work went into the aviation sector. So you had the institutional framework, which modernized the structural oversight and development of aviation. And then, of course, a lot of other work went, was undertaken in aviation. Um, the airport, Lyndon Pendling International Airport, which we were very proud to have renamed, was called the Nassau International Airport. And we renamed it, put a statue there, life-size statue for Lyndon Pendling. But during the last um, term, it was, um, we completed the two phases, last two phases. The first was $129 million of phase two, which was a 2,206,000 square foot. Phase three was completed at a cost of $84 million. And then we acquired the ASR-12, which was a um, radar, which was an $11.8 million airport, um, radar, state of the art. And um, we constructed an APP building, which houses a 3D simulator tower for continuous training and other state-of-the-art equipment for air traffic management. And that was at a cost of $3.8 million. And then um, in airport redevelopment, just so we could see how you can't do everything. Because I, I have people say, why you didn't do it, why you didn't do it? But you do a lot, and you start some things, but you don't expect to see them stuck if they're part of a progressive momentum. We were able to um, redevelop the Bimini Airport, an international airport. That came at a cost, I believe, around $8 million. The runway was extended. The terminal, the terminal was extended. We were, we were able to facilitate night flights for the first time ever. The San Salvador Airport was reconstructed after hurricane damage. And if you go there now, it's a beautiful facility. It, it, had, it, was, it was reconstructed with increased square footage at a cost of around $4.7 million. The Stanyu Key Runway, which the Stantec report that the member for um, Freetown spoke about before, when he sought to justify or rationalize the Arthurstown Airport neglect, um, Stanyu Key was on that list. The, our, our international consultants told us, forget about Stanyu Key. But Stanyu Key has, has so much economic, it's, it's, it's an iconic reality. See, they could advise you, you know. But we have to think for our people, and we got to stand for our people. And we were able to, and, and, and we, <clears throat> we were able to, uh, we spent, we extended the 3,000, that runway to 3,200 feet. It became IKO compliant, and um, at a cost of $2.4 million. 
And then there was the Mayor Buana runway, which was ultimately um, redeveloped by the uh, by the Mayor Guana and um, ID, what do they call it? The I group, I group. But I'm told, and we had to press and push very hard because they were um, not anxious to do that. But that was completed at a cost, I'm told, of about five million. And Bahamas Air was able to go there for the first time in years. Um, and then, of course, we completed our installation of solar, runway solar lights, because we want to do away completely with the practice of trucks or vehicles lighting runways. And we had started in our first term, and we completed it in the last term. And as a result, every single runway in this country, has, um, government owned, has been in, in, installed with solar emergency lighting. The only concern I have is I want to urge the minister to ensure continuous maintenance because that is always a challenge and I, I believe it was a challenge in a very high profile situation recently and I, and I just want to encourage um, him to uh, to ensure that these lights are kept operational and are properly maintained. <clears throat> of course we started the work on Exuma and North Ibuka and um, the plans were completed. We didn't get the shovel in the ground. I saw one of my speeches there. I said, shovel in the ground. I was praying for it, but we couldn't get to do it. But two and a half years later in now, we, you know, I don't know what's, I don't know where we are, but we would, we would love to see North Eleuthera and Exuma. Um, I don't know what happened to the plans that were done. We had hired consultants, Alexio, and um, uh, um, architects. And so I, and, and it was a lengthy process. Stantec was involved. So I don't know um, where that process is. But, uh, it's still in the pipeline, okay. And then um, we also, one of the final things we did, and I felt very badly we did not move it further along, was that we had completed the plans for terminals, the prototype for Moores Island, Great Harbor Key, and um, Great uh, Mayor Guana, and Mayor Guana, Mayor Guana. We also started, an, we, we also started another um, initiative which was the, a national policy on air connectivity. Because we know that there are certain islands in this country that do not have air connectivity in an archipelago. And we began, a, we, we formed a committee. Come on, man, I want to on, on, Honorable members. We formed a committee. The Minister of Aviation needs to listen, man. We formed a committee. <laughs> we formed a committee to look at air connectivity in the archipelago, places like Rum Key. Ragged Island, parts of Long Island with irregular um, service. And, and we wanted to begin a, a, a policy initiative to incentivize air connectivity to these, these uh, remote areas, which, uh, which has a, an effect of, of isolating communities. And we had, we had started that work, and I, I don't know where it is now. Uh, we, we did surveys of five airports to allow for night flights one of which was Bimini. I don't know where the status was. Um, we did significant work on the aircraft registry. In fact, we did, we did all of the groundwork. We did all of the um, consultancy work. We got the recommendations as to what should be done for implementation. And we're two and a half years in, and we're still waiting to see where we are with that. I know the minister is working very hard and very busy, but we'd like to see, um, I want to see, I want to see when he's finished his term, what he's going to be able to talk about when all is said and done. Um, and then of course, <laughs> you know, the, the FIR investigations. And you know, this has been something that the Progressive Liberal Party has championed from the first time, we got, uh, the first time we served, we got so far as an RFP and then we, we lost the elections. And then of course, the, the, the Free National Movement administration took over and it was articulated by the then Prime Minister that we will never own our airspace. We won again in 2012, we didn't accept that. We started the work right away. And I was on the front line of that, I'm very proud. And of course, the cabinet supported me fully. And you know, when, when I heard the member for Freetown in his first budget speech, when he said that, he said that, um, that I think he said, by, that was June, I think he said by April of the following year, we'd be controlling our own airspace. I thought it was hilarious. I said, obviously, he doesn't really understand. I think he does now, because we're two and a half years in, and um, the progress is not there to see. You know, I, I, was, I, was, I was angry with the member for Freetown when he said that he, I think he came in here and said that 
the Americans had intimated to him that they were they couldn't understand why no other minister of government had, had taken on this issue. And you know, I I I, was, I thought I. Uh, that, 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 must, that must have been one of those moments for him, one of those moments. But let me just say, <laughs> um, it's they're, they're, no, they're, 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 they're the same issue, and they were all, you met them on the table. In fact, you know, Mr. Speaker, a declaration of intent, which was the product of, of, of a very long um, consultative and negotiation process, was signed in March of 2017, where the American government and the Bahamas government signed to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs by their respective, our respective um, representatives. It was agreed that the Bahamas would begin collecting its own um, overflight fees, the Ameri that, the, that an agreement would be reached with the American government that would, for 10 years, it says 10 years, to manage the over, over, overflight because we don't have the capacity at this time, we don't have it. And that, um, that the Americans would work with us on expanding the airspace. The member just said about, it, about sovereign airspace. That's right there in the Declaration of Intent. He needs to go and read it. And that they would, they would, they would support our work at ICAO. Um, I have. I, 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 you, I will lay it. I'm going to lay it for the member. The member's denying it. Um, that, I, I, no, no, I can lay it for him because last time he said they told him something that you know made no sense. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, Mr. Speaker, the, um, the, the, I, I saw that there was an RFP process that fell by the wayside, and um, they're now looking at next year. But, and, and, and when I'm speaking with this issue, I want to give credit to Kelsey Johnson, the late Kelsey Johnson, because he, um, he died, he was buried a couple of weeks ago, but he was the High Commissioner in Canada, and he was our um, credentialed representative at the International Civil Aviation Organization, and he was so instrumental and so supportive of the work of aviation in general, including the air service um, agreements. We signed the 2025 20, um, air service agreements. I see the minister is carrying the, the trend forward, including the China one we signed with the Chinese. I think you've culminated um, the final thing there. Um, but Kelsey Johnson was um, the individual who um, played such a critical role in that. Um, and so the... The um, we would like to see. We, so I, I want to encourage the, the the minister. I don't know how he's um, you know because if he you know we, many reports, many studies were done on monetizing the airspace, on all these things, and so I saw he went back to do that again, and um, you know. But I want to urge him to complete the work because the hard work, the labor was done by the prior administration. So what you're doing now is just the implementation. And I, I want to invite you to, to aggressively pursue the implementation because the hard work was moving the paradigm from the 1953 agreement with the British, uh, the British government and the Americans to that March 2017 agreement with the Americans, the Declaration of Intent, um, which, uh, and it, it, I forgot, the other thing it did, it exempted Bahamian aircraft from paying overflight fees to the Americans. In fact, at that point, we were paying over flight fees, and it was retroactive to January. It was a significant um, milestone. So I want to invite the member not to seek to. I know, I know, every politician wants to be a hero, and nothing wrong with that. And nothing wrong with that. Okay, nothing is wrong with that. But let's let's do it in a way that it, it doesn't go from from the sublime to the ridiculous. <clears throat> You could you listen, you, you do I look afraid in any shape or form? Oh. Okay. So I don't know you, you can deal. <laughs> listen, that lady over there on Paris Island waiting on you, man. She waiting on you. And so um <clears throat> the I, 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 I was very disappointed that after all that work we did for all those years with a full Bahamian professional team. I and mean, then they did an outstanding job and were able to achieve a landmark agreement with the Americans that we're still um, here, you know, sort of. And if you need, listen, I can give you my cell number. You call me, you call me, call me, call me. you call me, let me whisper in your ear. Huh? I, I can whisper. <laughs> listen, 
Hey, don't don't dig that up now. <laughs> that was West End Airport, remember? Okay. That was West End Airport. Don't dig that up. Don't dig it up. Um, <laughs> the other, I just want to um, point to one or two things, Mr. Mr. Speaker. The, I see that the airport authority is um, publishing that they're going to increase the security um, tax. So I think that it's, the minister sh sh is obliged to give an explanation to the Bahamian people. I, I have some understanding of it, but he ought to have done it by now. See, I don't, we, we don't, we know that the, 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 I call it a little trick where you make it look like it's that independent, it's the airport authority board, nothing to do with you. But we know that it's the government, and you must take responsibility, you must explain to the him people why that is increasing. I also note that the cost of legislation now has gone from like the $2 or whatever it is, just to like some huge thing. It's now prohibitive and to um, acquire uh, legislation under this increase. And I, I'm just amazed that, that you have made it more difficult for people to access legislation. I want to throw it out there. <clears throat> the, um, I wanted to um, say to the member, the, minute, the member for Freetown, that as we all know, the NAD agreement was extended for, we are hearing another 10 years. There's been no formal advice to the Bahamian people about what you've done, at what cost, and why. And there's a level of accountability. You see, you can't just fob it off and say that's them. You must come to the Bahamian people and explain and rationalize why you are doing what you're doing. Because the original agreement was for 10 years, extended for one year, and then it came to an end. You've now, I believe, extended for an additional decade or more. I have no idea. No one knows. And you, I think you, you, it is incumbent upon you to account to the Bahamian people what you have done with the management regime at the Linden Pindling International Airport. The other... Um, oh boy, this is... Mr. Mr. Speaker, the member for um, Freetown has to understand, you know, that he's, you, you're in the vulnerable position, you know, you have to deliver. I've delivered, I've gone through it. What's your list? What's your list? What's your list? These were done. These, Mr. Speaker, these items I referred to took place, took place between 2012 and 2017. One political term. One political term. I, the speaker could ask the member to calm down. It, 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 take your pills, man. Take your pills. <laughs> take your pills. But one term. What I've described, one political term, not 10 years, one term, Speaker. I'm Speaker, on, on the, the member has spoken here about trailers when he was talking about Western Air. He, he tried to make his political points about that. I don't think he got very far, but what, what I want the member to appreciate that there are people right now in trailers. And uh, that should, I, I was hoping at, at some point, after you made the trite political, um, I call it cheap political point, that you would now tell us what's going to happen with that airport. Because you didn't finish that story with the trailers. And so what is uh, about the Western Air? What is going to happen with that airport? This is what we expect of a Minister of Aviation, an, an understanding of what is going to happen in these airports. I told you what we did all over the country. You, you, you shut down Arthur's Town. I, actually, I, well, somebody shut it down because it ain't operational, Speaker. Speaker, also on the issue of trailers, I, I, I note that the firemen at the airport are still in trailers, and they're very upset. It's two and a half years now, and um, the member, he needs to, you know, he should speak to that, because he talked with trailers at Western Air, and then uh, talked with Western Air and put people in trailers, and then he has the firemen in trailers. He needs to respond, Mr. Speaker. And finally, Mr. Speaker, the, um, I, and I see that, that, that we, I know that there was a thrust for PPPs, I'm watching it very carefully, especially after what we saw happen at Prince George Dock, and you've yet to lay that heads of agreement. The PPPs, we want to know what you're doing, who you're speaking to, and we, we, I hope you don't come with some last minute thing uh, we say that we gave away or we've, we've entered these arrangements of our national airports with private sector individuals without any discussion or dialogue or consultancy with the Bahamian people. So we're watching that because I noticed you've gone quiet on that one. Also, national, the, national, the National Flight Services, I understand that that is now um, gone to, um, that you're getting ready to, that's gone to a board, I think, some recommendation. We'll be watching that carefully because the member had committed about two years ago that no job would be lost at NASA Flight Services. 
And so we expect that political promise to be kept, Mr. Speaker. And then um, uh, finally, Mr. Speaker, the, 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 I, I end by saying that <clears throat> as I started, that we do support the, the legislation. Um, aviation safety is critical and investigation of accidents is linked to safety, the issue of safety and promoting safety. Again, I invite you to look at clause four, which speaks to the, um, the, uh, the um, admissibility of the report in civil proceedings. And, it is, I, and I invite you to look at the British Court of Appeal decision, which I believe is still the leading decision in this matter. Um, I, we, I, I want to also thank those who continue in the sector. Um, politicians come and go, as they know, but it's you who, who maintain the high standard and it's your high standard that maintains the, 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 the watchword for the Bahamian people. And we, we, we want to say we, we thank you. We encourage you to hit your highest intellectual points, to always have a passion for your country, which I am sure you do, because you're there. And, and, but but to, um, to, to ensure that our country goes from strength to strength. And always remember, and I got to say this to you, you know, the politicians, I, I, I'm from the old school. The politicians only know so much. They only know some fundamentals about what needs to be done and how, what, et cetera. But the technical people, it is you who bring the, the essence of the, the true advance of the Bahamian people. So continue to hone your skill and to give the good advice to the, um, to the current Minister of, Tour of Tourism and Aviation. And... Um, well, right there. Mr. Speaker, I, I, I want to get the declaration of intent because the member says he doesn't remember it. He's been here two and a half years, and if he is not familiar with that, then um, no wonder we can't get nowhere with that whole important exercise. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Honorable Member. Honorable Member, Honorable Member Frankson, are you, are you able to, to point quickly to the case? Oh, yes. the I, I just want to get the name. Yes. Sorry. Um, the case is, it's, it's, um, sorry. It's a court of appeal case. And it's called Rogers, R-O-G-E-R-S versus, versus Hoyle, H-O-Y-L-E. And I think it's a 2014 decision. I don't believe it has been overruled. Thank you so it's much. It's described as a leading decision. Um, and that's the it was delivered on the 13th of March, 2014. Thank you, Honorable Member. Thank you. Um, Honorable Member for East Grand Bahama. Oh, no, hold on. Are you, the chair recognizes the Honorable Member with respect to the tabling. Are you oh, sorry, ready thank now? You. Thank you, thank, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I just want to, uh, as I promised, uh, lay on the table these two communications that I made this morning on the Disaster Reconstruction Authority, uh, Special Economic Zone, and on the blacklisting. Thank you, Honorable uh, Member. Order that the documents thank be brought up. Mr. Speaker. Um, Mr. Speaker, uh, I, I, the chair recognizes the Honorable Member for Freetown. Should just a moment, Honorable Member. Um, uh, order that the documents still lie on the table. The chair recognizes the honorable member for Freetown. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I come to our attention that we have not laid the uh, Aircraft Accident Investigation Authority regulations. And I was wondering if I could beg leave to lay these, go back on the agenda to, to, to lay these regulations with the, with the blessing, of course, of the uh, opposition. Any, any objection by the opposition? Uh, honorable member. Honorable member, leave, leave granted. Huh? Leave granted. There was, there was no objection by the opposition. The order that the document be brought up. <laughs> Order that the document do lie on the table. You remember we ran out of ink, so we fixed the name. <laughs> As many? 
The chair recognizes the honorable member for Mangrove Key, South and Central Andros. The chair recognizes the honorable member for Bamboo Town. I think we only have, I think we only got another two speakers, if that. So, we, so we'll be in court. You all speak, one of us speak, the next person speak, and then we close it. Okay, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I do move that the House suspends until 3 p.m. for our lunching break. Honorable members, it has been moved and seconded that the business of this House do suspend until 3 p.m. this afternoon. As many as are in favor will remain seated. Those who oppose will stand. The business of this House stands suspended until 3 p.m. this afternoon. All right.